2013, level two, uh, mechanics, question two, forces in motion. The diagram below shows a seesaw on a pivot at its centre, with Jane and her dad sitting on opposite sides, such that the seesaw is in equilibrium. When you see equilibrium, forces and torques are zero. The net forces and net torque are zero. The mass of the seesaw itself is 60 kilograms. On the diagram below, I draw labelled vectors show all the forces acting on the seesaw. Okay, we've got the weight force of uh, Jane, so we'll call that F subscript J for Jane. We are assuming, without any other knowledge, that her dad will be heavier than her, have a greater weight force, so we'll draw the arrow longer. Uh, and we'll call that F uh, D for force due to dad, and uh, force due to gravity acting on dad, force due to gravity acting on Jane. And those two must be balanced by a force, and if we're roughly to scale, that force there, the reaction force, or the support force um, of the seesaw will be the sum of those two plus the one that I forgot, which also acts down towards the centre. Uh, we don't have the mass of Jane, but we'll just say she's about the same, maybe a little bit more than the mass of the seesaw. So there's a force due to gravity on the seesaw. Uh, we'll call it FSS. Getting a bit clumsy and confusing with all these uh, subscript names, but as long as you're consistent, you won't have any problems. So those are the four forces acting. Don't forget the mass of the plank. If it gives you specifically the mass of the plank, um, that's going to, or the seesaw, it's going to be helpful uh, to remind you. B. Um, Jane and her dad move to opposite ends of the seesaw. So ends, we're assuming that means they're exactly at opposite ends. The diagram below shows what happens when Jane sits at one end while the dad sits at the other. These are the various masses and the lengths, all the useful information. Calculate the size of the support force from the ground at the end where Jane's dad sits. Round the answer to the correct number of significant figures. This is a bit of a tricky question um, in terms of the significant figures, which I'll just talk about briefly, because then I'll forget about that later. This could be to one or two significant figures. We're not absolutely certain. I would say, suggest that it's probably two, since this mass here is also to two uh, significant figures, we would assume this is also two significant figures, and this one is definitely two significant figures. So if you haven't picked that one up, the final answer is going to be two significant figures. Um, so anyway, back to calculating the size of the support force from the ground. Um, let's just label, we've actually got uh, five forces now. We've got two forces upwards, the force at the centre uh, and the force from the ground. And we've still got our three forces downwards, the force of the dad, the force of the plank acting through the centre of mass and the force of Jane. Um, so when we're calculating the size of the support force from the ground, we, um, we don't know, what have we got? We've got three masses, the three downward masses we know. Um, so if we're considering the sum of the forces equation equaling zero, um, we know, let's just tick them off, we know the force due to gravity of the dad, the force due to gravity of the seesaw, and the force due to gravity of, the, um, of Jane. We don't know this, and we don't know this, but we do know these two both add together, so question mark plus question mark has to be equal and opposite to those three downward forces. What we would do um, is use our sum of the torques equation for equilibrium um, to eliminate either this, this one or this one. Since we're trying to find the support force of the ground, it's probably better to eliminate one, and the way we, we would do that is by using that natural pivot point as our um, point around which all the rotation is occurring either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, because then if our distance from the pivot point there is zero, that means we've got a zero, um, you know, for our torque equation, torque being force times distance. If our distance is zero, that's going to mean our torque is zero, and we can effectively ignore it, which is really handy. In fact, we can ignore two. We can ignore the rotational, uh, you know, turning force, the torque of the, um, this one as well of the weight force of the plank. Anyway, let's get on with it. Um, it's going to equal zero. Clockwise, the same direction that a clock turns if you're dealing with an analog clock, which not a lot of people do these days. We've got uh, one force, which is uh, the force of Jane's dad's mass, um, which is 72 times by 9.8. Um, that's, his, that's his force, times by the distance of 1.5 metres from the pivot point. Just put brackets around that to clear. A lot of people forget this step here, I'm multiplying by the force due to gravity, um, per you know, the gravitational constant, force due to gravity per kilogram. Um, 
Anyway, that, that there is the only uh, clockwise force. The other two forces cause rotation in an anti-clockwise direction. So we're going to go minus for those. And we'll deal with Jane first, which is 30 kilograms times by 9.8 times by 1.5 meters. And um, we would also minus, and I'm not going to finish this calculation for you, but uh, um, we'll just complete this equation. Um, we've got minusing the, the mass, this is the support force that we're trying to calculate um, of the seesaw from the ground. Okay, we'll call that FSSG, so you know which one I'm talking about, number two. Okay, times by the one point five metres from half the length of the seesaw, which is why we use 1.5 metres. And so we've got an equation here with only one unknown, which is our um, support force number two. So we can rearrange that calculator to find it out. Lovely. Uh, now we're on to basketball. Hillary attempts to throw a basketball into a hoop. Explain the effect of the forces acting on the ball once it has left Hillary's hand until it reaches maximum height. So if we have the hand here, Hillary's hand as she's throwing the ball. We've got the time um, that it takes to get from here to the maximum height. And then it's going to start down again, but we're only interested in this section here. Um, so explain the force, uh, plural or not plural, acting on the ball once it's left. So once it's left the hand, the only force acting on it, and this is what you would write, is the force due to gravity acting downwards. So two points, it's force due to gravity acting downwards. That's the net force. Because there's no other forces acting on it, we ignore air resistance, as the law of notation says, um, until it uh, reaches the height. So uh, how do we explain that? Um, we're explaining the effect. Okay, so the effect is that it causes to accelerate downwards in the direction um, of unbalanced force, according to Newton's second law, F equals ma. We don't know the mass, but we know that the acceleration is linked to the force. So the net unbalanced force is downwards due to gravity, therefore there will be acceleration downwards, um, which means the vertical velocity um, as it leaves her hand is gradually decreasing until it hits nothing, which is at the peak of the flight. So you would write that as well, you would write the top of the flight, um, the velocity vertical equals zero. The horizontal um, velocity is unchanged throughout the flight. Okay, because there is no horizontal force acting on the gravity as in a vertical plane, and we're only interested in the vertical velocity. So that a bit of information helps us for D. On another occasion, Hillary stands three metres from the hoop, the diagram is quite good there, uh, throws a ball with an initial velocity of 6.5 metres per second at an angle of 60 degrees to the horizontal. Um, also on the diagram, the hoop is 1.35 metres above the bottom of the ball where it is thrown initially. Okay, that's a lot of information to try and take in, especially when you're um, sort of dealing with this uh, as a first year student dealing with projectile motion and kinematic equations. Excuse me. Carry out calculations to determine whether or not the ball will go through the hoop. Okay, so that, that bit there you're probably panicking, but that's the main goal of it is to say yes it goes through the hoop or no. Um, and you have to do the calculations to prove it. And now this is where it makes it a bit easier. Begin your answer by calculating the horizontal and vertical components of the initial velocity of the ball. So we've got this. We've got 6.5 metres per second. Let's make this a bit longer. And we have to, and we know it's at 60 degrees. So uh, if we calculate the vertical and horizontal components, that's the vertical component in green. Um, it's, if we, that's the opposite of the 60 degree angle. So we're going to use sine 60 degrees equals opposite over so, you know, so tour, equals opposite over adjacent. So that equals, uh, I'll just call it x um, over 6.5. And see we can rearrange that to 6.5 sine 60 equals x, so that'll give it to us. Um, then I'll use red to do the horizontal, is this bit. The horizontal is going to be, because uh, it's the adjacent angle, it's ka, 
cos, so it's going to be 6.5 cos 60 degrees equals, we'll call that y, I've got my x and y axes a bit mixed up. Um, I could turn my iPad around, but you can't really turn your screen around, most likely, unless you're watching it on your own tablet. But anyway, so that's the initial start. We've got the horizontal and we've got the vertical. The next thing we need to know is the time of flight, how long it is in the air for, and there's quite a lot of ways that you could, you could approach this. Um, but let me just give you the overview first. Once you have the time of flight, so once you have the time of flight, you know how, what sort of horizontal distance it will cover. So when we're talking about the time of flight, we're probably considering the time to um, the height of the hoop. And there's actually going to be two of those because remember when you throw the ball, it's going to go up and then it's going to come down. And there'll be two points where the height of the hoop takes place. Unless the height of the, uh, the arc of the path goes below the hoop, in which case it'll clearly not go through. But um, we can use that distance there as the height of the hoop. We can use acceleration due to gravity. We can take the initial vertical velocity um, of what we calculated from our sine 60, and we can take, uh, and we're trying to find that time. So we've got that, we've got that, we've got that, and we're trying to find that. And we need a kinematic equation that links all of those. Uh, the one that does not have the final velocity. Um, what have we got? Vf equals vi plus at, d equals vi t plus half at squared. That sounds like it works. So we know t, we know a, we're just trying to, oh no, we don't know t, that's the only part we want. So we rearrange this equation for t. And because it's a t squared, um, we're going to get a plus or minus value for when we do the square root part. So one of those will make sense and one of them won't, or else it'll just give us the two times for those two locations. Um, and then we can use the time to that particular height and use our constant velocity. I realise this is starting to get a little bit ambiguous, but it's definitely an excellence question. If you're aiming for excellence, you'll be able to keep up. And we want to work out the distance horizontally to see if it matches up with the time vertically to those heights. Um, there's actually another way we could do this too. I'll, I'll explain that. It's a bit simpler. So VT, once you know the time and the horizontal velocity, you multiply that together to see if the distance uh, matches up. And if you've got two different times because of the um, way that we calculate it, then you'll try both and see if they match. If neither of them match, the answer is no. If one of them matches, the answer is yes, that it goes through in your calculation support. Um, but the easier way, and I'm just going to scroll down a little bit more for this, um, the easier way, once you know the horizontal velocity, um, and the, I know I'm going in the wrong direction now, but bear with me, and you know that it's a three metre range, so you know the horizontal velocity, you know the range, you can work out the time that it takes, um, T equals D over V, you can work out the time it takes to get to the hoop, and you can plug that into your uh, D equals V I T plus half A T squared, so you take that time to the hoop, you plug it in there, you know acceleration, you know the initial velocity vertically, and you know the time again. So you can work out if that distance is going to be equal to the 1.35 metres um, required um, to get it there.